Good morning. Salamat pagi. That's how we were greeted at Mennonite World Conference. The theme for our worship this morning, or well, actually for the month of August, it will be why do we go to church? It's connected with the Sunday school curriculum that the children have, the Shine curriculum. So we want, and I don't see a lot of children here, so hopefully there will be a few. Um, we hope that it will connect and give them up. Uh, Netanyahu is here, good. So that uh, we'll be able to connect with the Sunday school. This morning, our focus is on supporting each other. I personally have experienced much support from this congregation and from others, for which I am most grateful. I'm sure many of you can remember times when you have felt supported by your church. Later, we'll have an opportunity to share a little about those experiences. The support that we share in church goes beyond our walls to the broader church. And I particularly am, am thinking of the church around the world that we experienced in Indonesia. Please join me at the, in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Our God is within us, above us, and beside us. We gather here so we can seek God together. When we seek God together, we grow in faith together. We can be like Ruth and Naomi who supported each other. We can be like the Israelites who studied God's word together. We can be like the host of a great banquet welcoming all to gather. We can be like Tabitha, serving others by using the, her gifts. When we seek God together, we grow in faith together. May our worship today be a time of growing in our faith and in the likeness of who God is in this world. Let's pray. Gracious God, we're thankful that you are not some God far away, but that you draw near. You are beside us in every part of every day. You are here with us in this place. We ask today that you help us see opportunities to be your hands and feet and mouth and ears in this world. May we seek out opportunities to support each other. May we find ways to study your word together. May we be a people who welcome others into a relationship with you. May we find ways to serve you by serving others. We love you and praise you for who you are and how you continue to transform our lives. Amen. I invite Ed to come forward and lead us in a song that we learned, sang quite often at, uh, at Mennonite World Conference, Du Pangaren, O Prince of Peace. I won't ask you to do the Indonesian this morning. <laughs> Uh, the help with this. Okay, it says this is a Japanese song. We sang a number of times at World Conference. Uh, I invite you to stand and join in. Am I supposed to be in this weird thing? Okay, go ahead. For our 
confession or reconciling, I ask you to turn in the back of your hymnal to number 897. Let's read this together. 897. God of mercy, we are sorry that we have not always done what you wanted us to do. We have not loved you with all our heart, and we have not cared enough for other people. Forgive us through Jesus. Amen. We have so many examples of the brokenness in our world. Here in North America, we think of things like political divisions, gun violence, climate change, and so much more, including the car accident of Jackie Walorski this week. Our brothers and sisters around the world are also experiencing things like wars and oppression. All of this we place at God's feet, praying for peace in our world. We also ask for God to guide us to learn new ways to become God's mouth and hands and feet, supporting one another to bring peace on earth. Please join me in the litany printed in your bulletin as I light the peace candle. God of peace. Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our calling. And Ed is going to, re to uh, lead us in another song. Verse 779. This is a song from North America. Written by a Canadian Brian Warrior Sunderman. We'll invite you to join in on the chorus, uh, and the music group will sing the, the verses. <coughs> You're not alone. This is another one we sang at uh, Fort Conference.
I will invite those who are participating in the Reader's Theater to come forward. And I ask the children to pay special attention. We have a Reader's Theater, and uh, Greg is going to be the narrator. I think down below, maybe, or we'll up here. A mic. We'll oh, yes, down. you need a mic. Need a mic. So mic. come up here. And um, let's see. We have Mark playing Jesus. And then we also have have Beth playing Naomi, and narrator. I already said narrator. And uh, Melody is going to be Orpa, and Kaisa is Ruth. So I'll let you guys do it. Jesus, Jesus was teaching his disciples, love each other as I have loved you. There was, once, there was once a woman named Naomi. She and her husband and their two sons went to Moab when there was a famine in Bethlehem. Naomi's husband died, but her sons grew up and got married. One son married Ruth and the other Orpah. Then both Naomi's sons died, leaving Naomi Ruth and Orpah, all without their husbands. Love each other as I have loved you. Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem. Ruth and Orpah, you must each go back to your mother's house. You have been very kind to me. May God also be kind to you. I hope you will both marry again and have children. Goodbye, Naomi. Goodbye, Ruth. No, Naomi. Do not make me leave you. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. <laughs> Love each other as I have loved you. I speak to you as my friends, and I have told you everything that my father has told me. You did not choose me. I choose you, and I sent you out to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that will last. Then my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So love each other as I have loved you. Ruth loved Naomi. They supported each other and grew in their faith together. Thank you. I invite the children to come forward for children's time. Sue Ann has something for them. And then I'll ask them to stay up here because we have something else for them to do. Good morning. I don't hear anything. <laughs> you can just say good morning? Good morning. Thank you for coming. So, how many of you have hands? <laughs> Silly question, isn't it? But there are some people who are born without them, but fortunately most of us have hands. Um, what kind of things can you do with your hands? Do what? Lift things. Lift things. Good. Pull what else? Things. Pull things. Build things. Build things. Make things. Lots of things we can do with our hands. And, you know, Jesus wants us to use our hands to help people. What kind of things can you do to use your hands to help people? What could you do? If somebody if somebody does this, what does that mean? Um, uh, yes. Does that mean good job? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you just turn around and give thumbs up to the congregation? 
Can you do that? Turn around and go like this. No? Okay. That's okay. But if somebody does this, if somebody does this to you after you've done something, does it make you feel good? Yeah. You say, oh, I must have done a good job. Now, if you see somebody and they wave to you, does that make you feel good? Yeah. Yeah. So if we wave to the congregation, oh, they're waving back. Look at them. You see them waving to us? That makes people feel good. And even when you wave, if you give a smile with your, with your waving, that helps. Sometimes you can also, do you ever help your mother with your hands? Or your father? What? What do you help your mother do? Chores. Chores, yeah. Some kind of things at home. Maybe make something in the kitchen, help put the laundry someplace. Do something that they ask you to do with your hands? Huh? You don't know how to cook. Well, I'll bet you'll learn how to cook with your hands. <laughs> now, do you also have feet? Yeah. Okay. Stomp your feet. Yeah. So what can you do with what can you do with your what do you do with your feet? Walk. Yeah, you walk. Right, there are sometimes people are born and they don't have legs. Mm -hmm. That's right. We can also help people with our feet by going to visit people who are sick. Maybe sometimes your parents will take you along and you'll visit somebody who's sick. The other thing you can maybe do with your feet is if you're at school and you see somebody who's all by themselves, maybe you could go over and play a game with them. Maybe you could kick a soccer ball with them. You could do something with your feet to help somebody. We can use our hands and our feet to hurt people, but we can also use our hands and our feet to help people. We have a new person here and she has both hands and feet. Do you know who this is? What's her name? What's her name, Joyce? Marcella. And Marcella is like three months old about. <laughs> about. <laughs> and she has hands and feet, but she can't use them very well to help anybody right now, but she can move them around. And if you get a chance, you might be able to hold her. And that would be using your hands, wouldn't it? You know, sometimes we don't feel like helping people, do we? But if we ask Jesus, Jesus can help us want to do the right thing. Because sometimes we don't, I don't always want to do the right thing. Sometimes I need help. And God and Jesus can help us do that. We're going to sing a song that's going to be kind of like a prayer, which is Jesus be my center. And we're going to have some people come up and help us do that. And I think maybe you've sung this before in Sunday school and maybe did some motions. You know, before you start that, I also want to, you know, the last song we sang in our book, I looked across and what did I see? Lots of hands, hands helping each other. In some ways, the hands reminded me of human hands. Some ways they reminded me of God's hands or Jesus's hands. But this is in our hymn book. So they're going to they're going to talk to you about this song here and you're going to help. The children have this song in their Sunday school material. And do you remember singing this song before and doing this when we said Jesus? Okay. Amanda and I will lead you, but we'll ask the kids to stay up here and they can help too because after a while, they'll remember this. Jesus, Jesus, the sign for Jesus is touching the middle of your hands where the nails went in. This is American Sign Language for Jesus. So Jesus, be the center, be my source, be my light, Jesus. Jesus, 
be thy center. Be my hope, be my song, Jesus. Jesus, be my vision. Be my path, oh no, it's this way. Be my path, be my guide, Jesus. Be the fire in my heart. Be the wind in my sails. Be the reason that I live, Jesus. And then we do Jesus be the center again. Thank you. We may be singing that for the rest of this month, so we will learn those actions a little better along the way. Our scripture reading this morning is from John 15, verses 12 to 15a, and Juan is going to join me to read the Spanish this morning. I'll let you go first, okay. if you're okay with that. Hi, I'll, I'll be reading Juan 15 to 15 to 12 or 15, yeah, 15 to 12. Y este es mi mandamiento que se amen unos a los otros, como yo los he amado. Nadie tiene amor para grande que el dar la propia vida por sus amigos. Ustedes son mis amigos, y si hacen lo que yo les mando, ya no los llamo siervos, porque el siervo no está tanto de lo que hace su amo. Los he llamado aquí, amigos, Porque todo lo que 
a mí, mi padre, le oí decir, te lo dará a conocer a ustedes. Thank you. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Invite Pastor Tim to come forward and give us the message that God has given him this week. So why do we bother coming to church? Why show up here week after week? And I actually want to ask you that question. Why do you show up week after week? A couple of you tell me. Why do you show up? Anybody? Just something. <laughs> I would love to think that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. To sing together. Yeah. It's just what you do. It's just what you do. <laughs> A lifetime of habit, right? To be with friends. Yeah. 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 Well, we are going to look at some of those reasons this month, and we won't hit every one of them, but we're going to talk about support and community. We're going to talk about a place where we welcome everybody and learn how to welcome people. A place to study and connect both with God's word and God's story, and also a place to learn how to serve, to serve God, to serve each other. But you know, um, I think maybe I've told this story once before. When my son David, who is now 38, was a senior in high school, and we were talking about church one time, and he kind of said to me, he said, Dad, rather than going to church, why not just get together with some of my friends and talk about this stuff, talk about faith, talk about life. Well, it was a fair question. Um, and I, you know, I knew that group of friends of his well enough to know that they got into some good discussions sometimes, and they did support each other in many ways, and they, did, uh, they would talk about faith from time to time. But I said, you know, there are some things you miss in doing that, and among them being, in that situation, you're only with friends that you already like. What about folks that you aren't naturally drawn to? There's something about learning to build community and friendships with people beyond just people that we naturally like. So there's something to learn how to be a support to each other, even if it takes us a little bit out of our comfort zone and puts us with people who aren't just like us with just exactly the same interest. Church needs to be about supporting each other, but also about widening the circle of people whom we support and, whom, and from whom we receive support so that we are learning to love people who aren't just like me. Last week when we were worshiping together with three other congregations, I talked about the church being a laboratory of love. And part of the experimenting and work of love is this, in this laboratory is expanding our circle of support. It would be true that learning to support each other and learning to expand or widen that circle will often happen during times of stress. It is during times of stress that we need support. So it is often when we need that or when we are called upon to respond to such need that our circle widens a bit. Both of these aspects of supporting each other and of expanding our circle that happens during times of stress helps us to grow in our faith, in love, and in our understanding of God's reign and what it means to follow Jesus. I see both of these aspects in the story of Ruth and Naomi from the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. The story of Ruth begins with famine, displacement, and death. When famine hits Judah, Elimelech, I can never say that name right, but I think I got pretty close, takes his wife Naomi and their two sons from Bethlehem to live in the neighboring country of Moab. And Moab isn't well liked by the, by the uh, 
by the Israeli people. There is a lot of conflict. But in Moab, Elimelech and Naomi find food, and they find wives for their two sons. Then tragedy strikes when Elimelech and the two sons die, leaving the women to fend for themselves. Naomi hears that the famine in Judah is over, and she decides to return to her country. And she, when she sets out for Bethlehem, her hometown, her two daughters-in-law decide to go with her. And Naomi really carefully considers the welfare of both Ruth and Orpah and tells them to return to their homes and families where they can find new husbands and have families of their own. They protest, but Orpah, finally convinced after considering her situation, turns back. But apparently after considering her situation, Ruth vows to stay with Naomi and be true to Naomi's God and have her people become her people. And so Ruth travels with her to Bethlehem in a new life. So we know there's already two stresses for these folks in this story, but they also are already expanding the circle. Naomi and Elimelech's family go to Moab because of famine, and then Ruth decides to return to go among Naomi's people. So those are, those are both stresses, and they're also widening the circle. The new life in Bethlehem is not easy for Ruth and Naomi. Naomi's bitter because of the tragedy that is, that's befallen her, and widows are at the mercy of male relatives for care and protection. Ruth is a stranger in a foreign land where Moabites, her people of origin, are despised and prohibited from belonging to the religious community of Israel, even to the 10th generation, according to Deuteronomy. This long-standing tension between Moab and Israel runs counter to the actions of the ordinary people in this story. They support each other and expand their circles even during these incidents of stress. Naomi treats Ruth and Orpah as daughters in their homeland. And Ruth's actions illustrate the same steadfast love for Naomi. And I think Orpah also had love for Naomi, but she probably looked at her situation and said, I probably am better to go back. Ruth, whatever her situation was in her homeland, looked at it and said, I think I'm better staying with, staying with uh, Naomi. In the chapters that follow today's text, uh, or the initial part of the book of Ruth, Boaz, who is an extended family member of Naomi, gives food and protection to Ruth as she gleans in his fields. His willingness to fulfill the role of what was called a kinsman redeemer or family redeemer to Naomi and Ruth demonstrates his loyalty to family and compassion for widows and foreigners. During a time when people of other cultures and nationalities were excluded from worship and community life, the story of Ruth provides a different perspective. By the end of the book, the story has come full circle. Ruth finds food and a husband as she gleans in the fields. Her loyalty and love for her mother-in-law, Naomi, are rewarded with a home and eventually a son. And famine is replaced by plenty, displacement by a new home, and death by new birth. And the God of Israel welcomes Gentiles, we find out, even Moabites, into God's family. It is this kind of circle widening during times of stress that we try to practice in our own laboratory of love, the church, as we support each other. Sometimes we do it extraordinarily well. Other times we don't. But we keep at it. Because in the process, we also become a place to practice forgiveness with each other, which is another aspect of love, support, faith, and community. The gospel text from John today is pretty straightforward. Jesus tells us to love one another. And if we get that central message, we've become friends of Jesus who are paying attention to what he's told us. What I find fascinating is what surrounds this part about um, about loving one another in the Gospel of John. Prior to it, Jesus is telling us to stay plugged into him, into following him as the true vine. And Jesus is the true vine who calls us to make our home with him. And in so doing, we plug into what God as our parent wants for us as God's children. 
And then this central command to love is followed by acknowledgement that the world around us will often not get this way of living. I find our society doesn't totally discount love. I mean, if some of you remember back in the 80s, there's, there was a song called The Power of Love. And it was big during that time, which I, I listened to a lot because my kids were listening to it a lot at about that age. But, you know, I think part of it is trying to define what love is. Last week, and I'll emphasize it this week, I find one of the better definitions to be given by the late psychologist Scott Peck, who defines it love as when we extend ourselves to enrich either our own or another's spiritual growth, well-being, or wholeness. And so I think our society knows that, there, that this thing called love is important, but often doesn't know really what it is and what that takes. And it doesn't really become central as the way of life. Survival or getting ahead or being first, either personally or as a nation, seems to often take first place, not loving God and loving others in creation. But in Jesus' way of living, supporting each other, loving one another, and find a community with whom we can concretely practice this as a way of life is central. So why go to church? To be a laboratory of love where we support each other in community and widen the circle. And I'm keeping the sermon particularly short today so that we can have a testimony time. Supporting each other in stressful times is one of the things this congregation does well. Not perfectly, but well. And I suspect many of us have testimonies of times that this congregation, or maybe one in our past also, have been supportive to us in a time of stress and where we have found our circle widened. We want to hear some of those stories this morning. So let me tell you what's going to go on. We're going to sing uh, the song, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant, and then we're going to have a time of testimony of testifying or being witnesses to the Spirit's work in support of community. Now, I also want to tell you, and there will be uh, folks available with a microphone to bring around, and I also want to let you know that that part of it will still be being recorded. So just if you have something you want to share, I want you to be aware of that. And then later on, when we go to taking prayer requests, we'll have a time when we're, when we're not recording. So I just want everybody to be clear about that. So come and lead us in the song, and then we will have a time of testimony. 778, 778, will you let me be your servant?
I'll start out a testimony time just by saying even this past week, I felt the support of this congregation. Um, a week ago this past Tuesday, my last aunt on my dad's side, the one that I've been POA for for quite some time, uh, passed away, not unexpectedly, in fact, somewhat graciously that that happened as she was suffering from severe dementia. But uh, both the deacons and, and a couple other people just kind of said, hey, Tim, make sure you do what you need to do to have some time with your family this week, in part because I was going to be uh, officiating the memorial service for her. And uh, so I felt free to, I mean, I think actually, to tell you the truth, I think I got in pretty close to a full work week too, but I also felt free to just do what I needed to do to take the time to go to Bluffton uh, for the memorial service on Wednesday of this past week, and then also to go to Bluffton for the uh, graveside service on Thursday. And I'm really grateful to the deacons and others who just, and, and I feel like this has been the habit of this congregation, who's when things like that happen, have free me up to be able to do those things. And I'm very grateful for that. What are other testimonies of support that we have to share with each other? They can be recent, they can be from long ago, wherever. I'm Annie Moore, and I have two that I that stand out for me. I mean, there's many, many more, but two for sure. One was when Ron passed, was dying and passed away. A group of people came one evening and sang for him, and he just loved that. that was, and that was very meaningful to me. And then the day he died, there was another group of people with us, and we helped walk him to God. And again, that was very meaningful to me, to be there, that I wasn't alone with him. With him. And the joyful one was when I turned 70, everybody turned out and we had a party together. That was fun. Um, there are many times when I've been helped, we've been helped in this congregation when there have been crises in our lives. But the one I want to share this morning is when my mother passed away when she was going through chemo. Uh, the support I received that we received in this congregation was just so helpful and just made me feel that what do people do who don't have community to support them? Because people came to visit with her, they sang for her, they, um, and they helped us with food when she passed away. And it was just, uh, just really appreciate this congregation for all their help. Ed Kaufman, one Sunday morning when I was pastoring in Beatrice, Nebraska, received a call that my brother was in the hospital having suffered a brain aneurysm. Um, the congregation gathered around, uh, offered to preach the next Sunday, do all sorts of things like that, um, felt a lot of support there. And then when we got to Colorado, another congregation that they had had some um, just brief connection to, offered all of us lodging, food, places to meet. Um, we felt support from congregations that we didn't even know. Um, I guess the thing that I remember most was when I went to sell my house, all the support that I felt. Um, the young people came and helped, and the older people came and helped, and it just was a, a big lift to the burden that I felt in trying to sell this house by myself. And yeah, thank you. Deb Kravis, um, obviously I've had a very interesting year. Um, thank you for all the support. I definitely, there's a song by Josh Baldwin, I see the evidence all around me. And that's kind of been my theme song for this year. Um, all the outreach, all the love, meals, prayers. And not only does it affect me when I was in the hospital for surgery and every, um, the different medical staff I'd meet through the procedures, they're always like, you are so calm. Do you not know what's going on here? And I said, if you knew all the people praying for me. So it was a good witness to the medical staff also. I said, I got people from the East Coast to the West Coast, the entire church, couple churches. So not only do you support the person you're praying for, but it's a witness to everybody around. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, first, um, I'd like to pay tribute to Cal Redekop, who was up in the 90s now when he died, about three days before I had a birthday. Um, I've known him since I was a high school, no, or college student, I guess, and in so many ways have uh, appreciated his, his influence. He taught uh, sociology, but uh, he taught ever so many practical things, uh, whether it's uh, a uh, Mennonite organization connected to MEDA or another one on business making, things like that. Uh, so I often disagree with him too, but I still give thanks for this wonderful uh, life that he was able to lead. Um, secondly, um, I've been reading stuff again this morning that I got yesterday on the email and uh, wasn't planning to, to be part of this thing. But um, we are talking about some divisions in our country here, and including between Christians, including our family members, who are believing crazy things, uh, untruths, and expect us to believe them. Um, that, that is uh, a problem we are wrestling with here. What I was reading was um, a letter from Taras Dyatlik from Ukraine, reporting on how many of the Russian Christian ministers, the so-called evangelical movement, were putting pressure on the Ukrainians to take the first step to reconcile with them. And they're essentially expecting uh, that the Ukrainian Christians would agree that we were a horrible place and needed to be denazified which has been, always been absurd. Um, and so in this uh, piece, Taras reflects on that and says, why should we join you? Why are we the cause of the disunity here? Uh, the unity is something that Christ provides for all of us, and the forgiveness comes through that. Uh, we also don't think very much about what's going on in Ukraine and all across Europe where those refugees are scattered as well as in Canada and USA. But um, I was reading about a congregation that um, took in 60 refugees because that uh, uh, those refugees had lost their homes and so they put them up in the church. And since they kept on getting more refugees, Many of the church members then have been housing refugees, not for a day or two, which they thought happened, and then those people would move off, but some of them have stayed for months now and are trying to survive. And uh, finally, I also read a story about um, a person who, had who was an orphan and had lost his home there, was granted an, uh, an apartment. Um, sometime in, in March, uh, April. He was the person killed when a Russian tank came by and shot at this apartment building, which is a civilian place, uh, another war crime. And um, then uh, that person telling the story um, discovered that his own daughter was among those who had also been killed. And how am I as a pastor supposed to be preaching forgiving. Lord help us. And they cited uh, uh, the Orthodox uh, response, uh, those of the genuine Orthodox, like this priest in uh, Coloma, um, not far from Moscow, who um, went through the scriptures and couldn't find anywhere the phrase special operation. But the word war was everywhere. And so he paced put that on the website of their congregation, and that cost them $300 fine. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy is yeah. what we, yeah. it's about all we can say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Walter was going to say how much we appreciated your prayers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and all the support that we received during the time when Walter had his uh, open heart surgery. You know, you don't always have to respond with words. 
for, for me especially, well, all the food that was brought in for two weeks was just amazing. But to know that you are here, you, like in the back of my mind, I know that you are all with us. And for me, that solidarity is so important. So I would just want to thank all of you. I really appreciated that. Grace. Uh, for just the support and being there every every time that I needed help, like um, for instance when I was pregnant, for the support and um, coming visit me at the hospital when I had a C-section and the beautiful baby shower that I had, we had a lot of things that we're still using to this day. So I really appreciate it and yeah. That's yeah, it'd be good to have you and Marcella here this morning too. Sue and Van Gutten. Um, this is kind of a, I've, I've felt the congregation frequently when we've had situations where um, we needed help or we were in the hospital, um, people visited. But I also want to say that what this congregation has brought to me is an incredible enrichment of people that I would not know if, if I had not been here. And just a very, uh, an example of that is yesterday, I went to the dunes with Susan's family and some of the Odiambos and Grace and Marcy. And I was, I was holding Marcy in my arms and I was thinking, this, this is a holy moment. Yeah. Um, this is a child of God, this is a precious person. And watching the children play in the water. Um, what a joy, and if it wouldn't be for Hively, I would not know these people. So when you talk about enlarging, enlarging the congregation, enlarging our Christian outreach, um, Hively has been that. Thank you. I'm going to, oh, okay, hold on. Yeah. Just, just thought this fit in well. Um, this congregation also supports people around the world through MCC. Um, recently, we sent some refugee kits, and those have arrived and, and are being used. And I, I just, those things are so important, and I think we forget that. When we met um, someone from Sudan who wanted to, who was part of a congregation, they wanted to become Mennonite. And we said, why do you want to be Mennonite? Why did you choose us? And they said, because we saw what the Mennonites did and how they served us and helped us. And this congregation is part of that. So, yeah. I'm going to close this time of testimony, and we're going to move into prayer time. And how we're going to do prayer time today is, is uh, I am going to uh, 